Kia ora koutou katoa. Thanks for coming to today's update at the Ministry of Health. I'm Michael Dreyer, I'm the Ministry's Chief Technology Officer. Today I'll be giving you an update on the new IT systems that have been developed and rolled out specifically for our Omicron response. I'm joined remotely by Dr Carolyn McElnay, who's the Ministry's Director of Public Health, and she will start today's briefing with an update on today's COVID-19 numbers. Over to you, Caroline. Uh, thanks, Michael, and kia ora koutou katoa. Apologies that I can't uh, be with you in person. I'm um, zooming in from sunny Napier. Today, I'm going to give you an update on the case numbers, hospitalisation numbers, and also just outline some recent research from Otago University. So firstly, today we are reporting 23,894 new cases across the country with 9,881 of those in Auckland. And we'll have further breakdowns of those figures in our 1 p.m. statement. Aucklanders yesterday recorded their highest number of rapid antigen test results ever, 43,735. That's 25% higher than the previous highest day, which was last Monday. So a big thank you to everyone that's been putting their results into my COVID record. You will be aware of commentators like Auckland University's Rod Jackson, who says, um, whilst we're tracking the daily case numbers, they are only a minimum, given the uncertainty that there is around reporting of results, and the actual number of cases in the community is likely to be considerably higher. That's one of the reasons why we're focusing on our hospitalisation numbers. And today there are 756 people with COVID-19 in hospital today. 16 of those are in ICU or a high dependency ward. The largest proportion of cases in hospital continues to be in the three Auckland Metropolitan District Health Boards. Information provided by those DHBs today 
is that case hospitalised numbers in Auckland are around the same as yesterday. In Waitemata, they're slightly up, and in counties Manukau, they're slightly down. The, the actual numbers um, we can provide for you in the statement. Now, the ICU numbers are similar to yesterday. The DHBs report continued pressure on staffing, particularly providing cover through the night. Though today, I'm pleased to report that the DHB say they are managing and that occupancy levels remain manageable. People will be concerned about the number of people in the hospital, and, and unfortunately, we do know that this number will grow. However, when compared to the Delta outbreak, the people being seen in hospital with Omicron have less severe illness. The lesser severity is strongly related to New Zealand's high vaccination rate. And many experts rightly warn that the illness can be very severe for those who are unvaccinated. While still early in our Omicron outbreak, our figures show that based on the data available, unvaccinated people are four times overrepresented in the current hospitalisation data. Just 3% of eligible people aged 12 and over in New Zealand have had no doses of the vaccine. However, of the eligible people hospitalised since community transmission of Omicron was detected, 17% have had no doses of the vaccine. During last year's Delta outbreak, the highest number of cases in ICU at one time was 11. That was reported on the 10th of November when there were 81 cases in hospital. Of those, 13.6% were in ICU. Whereas for comparison with this outbreak, on Sunday the 6th of March, there were 618 cases in hospital with 10 in ICU just 1.6%, so a much lower proportion of cases being admitted to ICU. Now, as you're all aware, isolating infectious cases has been a key strategy for preventing the spread of COVID. However, as our case numbers increase, our health services are stretched trying to operate services with large numbers of staff members being required to self-isolate. One measure that's been put in place, place to address this is an arrangement which now allows critical healthcare workers with COVID to return to work earlier than usual if their absence would mean that a critical health service would have to stop functioning. Now, this can only occur if the case meets strict criteria and all steps are taken to protect the safety and well-being of the case themselves, their patients and other staff. The staff members' well-being will be checked daily and if they develop symptoms or their symptoms worsen, they would stand down from work. There are two pathways currently available for critical healthcare workers who are cases to return to work. The first pathway allows healthcare workers with two negative rats to return to work on day six after they've had their negative rats. And the second allows COVID positive staff to return to work on wards where all the patients are also COVID positive without any stand-down period. Now, this second pathway can only be used if all other options have been exhausted, but it's an extra tool that enables our health system to keep running and keep functioning. Whilst at work, the healthcare worker must use a well-fitted N95 medical mask, follow infection control procedures, Take care in any shared break or eating areas, avoid public transport where possible, and follow our standard advice for community cases outside of work. Before they can return to work, there's a number of conditions that those healthcare workers need to have met. They need to be fully vaccinated and boosted, be asymptomatic or have mild symptoms. They must agree to return. Um, staff should not feel pressured and to return to work. Uh, they must um, work in a situation where their absence actually puts an essential service at risk. 
and um, as I've said before, they can return to work um, on day six if they had those two negative tests. But we're very mindful of the very special situations for staff who may have to return to work at day zero and the um, support that's in place um, to allow that. In that situation, though, they will only be working with COVID-19 patients. This approach is a pragmatic one to help ensure we continue to have staff available to treat individuals with COVID, but it also balances the significant risk to patients from hospital services not being able to operate against the small risk to patients from staff who have COVID in light of all the protections in place. And um, we can provide the details um, of those criteria um, further to you. Uh, and lastly, I'd just like to say a big thank you to the health staff across the MOTU for being flexible. And we're seeing this all across the country, but particularly in Auckland because of the bulk of the cases, and how flexible staff are being and working together to keep our health system running. And just a bit about the Otago University research. You, you may already have seen a recent analysis by Dr. Jennifer Summers, Professor Michael Baker, and Professor Nick Wilson of Otago University's Public Health Department. Uh, they've just released an analysis of um, excess winter mortality and they found that New Zealand's COVID-19 response had saved 2,750 lives from excess winter mortality. That's a common public health way of comparing the number of deaths during winter uh, compared with those in a non-winter period. And while we've known for some time that personal hygiene social distancing and lockdowns have suppressed all other respiratory viruses. This is the first time that we've seen that impact across the board being measured. Separately, the researchers also used our world and data figures to calculate New Zealand's mortality experience compared to various other countries on a per capita basis over the first two years of the pandemic. And, and in summary, compared to overseas experiences, New Zealand has seen a very low number of deaths um, due to COVID. Whilst Omicron has seen proportionately fewer cases admitted into hospitals overseas, what we're seeing overseas is the sheer number of cases, meaning that hospitals abroad are likely to continue to come under pressure. For example, Germany last week reported its highest total number of daily cases at 161,040, followed by South Korea at 147,429. And because of the differences in testing and reporting times, these figures are expected to be lower than the true number of infections. So finally, please remember that we can all play our part to slow the spread of the virus, to help protect our most vulnerable, and make sure our health system is able to cope with extra demand. Please keep doing the basics well. Wear a mask to protect yourself and others. Physically distance, practice good hand hygiene, and please get tested if you develop symptoms, stay home if you're unwell, and we encourage everyone to continue to promptly report their test results. I'll now hand back to Michael. Thank you. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, so in recent weeks, the Ministry of Health has re released a large amount of new technology to support the Omicron response. You can now self-report a rat's test online um, via my COVID record. You can order a rat uh, via the same channel. Uh, you can record where you've been via a new and improved tracing, tracing form to support contact tracing efforts and visit a one-stop shop called The Health Hub to find information relevant to your situation. These systems were designed, developed and delivered uh, and te or tested and delivered at pace. However, with all new IT systems, there are initial bugs uh, and process flows to sort out. So I wanted today to, to outline some of the improvements uh, that have been made since they were first released. Like the rest of our COVID-19 response, we are constantly refining our systems, taking on board feedback from our health workers and our health, con health consumers. The COVID clinical care module is technology which joins up health information about each case for our healthcare workers so they can ensure those with COVID-19 they are caring for have access to the clinical care and welfare support that they might need. When the system first went live in mid-February, around 4,000 cases an hour could be processed through these systems. During busy mid-morning periods, 
we could see that this peak caused delays. Further capacity has now been built into this system over the past two weeks, which means it can now handle around 20,000 cases an hour, and we continue to work through and enhance these processes. The RATS requester site went live last week, and dis despite an initial intermittent bug, uh, which was fixed within the first few hours, it is now fully operational and being used nationwide. Yesterday, 55,000 total orders were placed. Uh, all but 1,000 of these were through the, the, the web form uh, rather than the call channel and around 220,000 total test kits were ordered. Please remember to report your result on my COVID record, even if it's negative. And please make sure everyone in your household has uh, also su re submitted or reported theirs. Later this week, we will ena enable you to report a RATS result on behalf of someone else, perhaps in your family, or particularly for children under 12, um, via the My COVID Record tool. Don't forget there's also an 0800 number for this, if you prefer or if you don't have internet access. Uh, you can also do this via your GP. The self-reporting of RATS provides, helps provide a clearer picture of how the pandemic is progressing, both at a national and a regional level. It is essential we have as much information as possible to help inform public health decision making. We have also improved the online contact tracing form. After we heard from the public, it was taking too long to fill out. With public health advice, we have streamlined it to focus on high-risk events um, or exposures and welfare needs. This has reduced the average time it takes to complete the form from 30 minutes down to eight minutes. We also heard that people wanted a single source of information about what happens when they or someone else close to them gets COVID. So last month, we launched the COVID-19 Health Hub. It's a simple, easy to navigate, one-stop shop with all this information. There is also plenty of this information available, as always, by, via the United Against COVID website. From the 10th of March, we will be going live with text messages that notify people that their isolation period is complete. And we're also considering reminders for those people that have uh, ordered and received RATS tests, um, but have not yet submitted a result one way or another. As with all of our systems, we have 0800 numbers uh, for those who cannot access information online or simply wish to speak to someone for advice. Where possible though, we do encourage to please use these online services. Are they, are they are quick to use? Uh, I like to think they're easy. Um, and they take pressure off our call centres and off our frontline staff. Um, so we do appreciate the public's engagement with these already, it's great. Uh, so we'll now stop to take questions. Can you, Dr McElnay, tell us how many hospital staff are currently off work because they are affected with COVID-19? Um, I don't have the exact numbers. Um, we will see if we can get those numbers for you, but I don't have those to hand. Is that a, is that a figure that the Ministry of Health collates? A colleague of mine is <laughs> through DHBs and hasn't had much, much luck, but it seems like a pretty critical figure to have. I'm not sure that the, the Ministry of Health collects those numbers because the management of the um, absenteeism and, and, and illness among staff is managed at the DHB level. So the DHB um, will have those figures and they are the ones who have been you know, managing and balancing the staffing issues uh, to be able to move staff around within within the DHB uh, to make sure that the services are, are running or you know adjusting some of the running of services to to free up people in other places. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of uh, quite a bit of movement of um, um, some staff you know doing alternative duties in order to to cover the essential areas. So the DHBs will have those figures. I'm, I'm not aware that, that we at the ministry collect those, but we can look into that um, for you. But certainly at a DHB level, it should be available. Dr McElnay, are you able to explain, please, how the Queenstown um, vaccine temperature uh, botch up was able to happen? Um, thank you. Um, yes, I've, I've spoken to um, some of the staff in Southern District Health Board, and I don't know the details of, of what actually happened there, but I am aware that um, this was a, a cold chain issue uh, that came to light, and cold chain is one of the critical areas for all vaccine um, distribution. It's something that we've had. We've had um, systems in place 
for any vaccination provider, regardless of the vaccine, to make sure that the cold chain is maintained throughout its whole distribution, right up until it's arrived at the health provider and then given to the individual. So I've been advised that the DHB is obviously managing that situation and that they will be doing an investigation into, or an event review, into what exactly happened in this situation. I don't know the details at this moment. Yeah, given the fact that there was a number of frontline workers that have been affected by this, they haven't been fully protected. Is that good enough from your perspective? I think it's very unfortunate that this has happened and we really apologise to those individuals who went along to get vaccinated and then find that because of this issue, that their vaccine may not have been as effective as they thought it was going to be. I am aware that all of those people who were affected by the issue in Southern have received a letter from the DHB with individualised details about what they need to do so that they can go and get revaccinated. And I just want to reiterate that our apologies and our sympathies for the people concerned with this. Dr McInerney, what public health advice was considered when making the decision to send COVID positive workers back to work? So we did a very thorough review of the likely risks and benefits for enabling this to occur. As you're all aware, there is pressure with the large number of cases and household contacts that we're seeing at the moment amongst our healthcare staff, but particularly for cases who are well. And there are some very specialised areas where it can be quite challenging to continue to operate those services. So we looked at how this could be enabled in a very safe way. We're very mindful of the health and safety of the staff member, as well as the health and safety of their co-workers and clearly their patients. As I said in my initial talking points, there are two different paths. The first path is where the case is at day five. If they're well, they've been off work, they have to stand on for those five days, but they do a rat test if that's negative. They do a repeat rat test the next day. And if that's negative, then they can go back to work. So we've got a high degree of confidence that those workers are no longer infectious because of those two negative rat tests at near the end of their isolation period. What we have said for the other pathway is that that is something that should only be used in extreme circumstances. And I'm not aware that it is actually being used at the moment, but we put it in place in case it is necessary for some of the highly specialised services that we know do operate in Auckland. And that's the situation where the case would be asymptomatic, so no symptoms or even just very mildly symptomatic. It allows for them to return to work from their day zero from their first positive rat test, but with very strict criteria around when they can work. And of course, they can only work then in COVID wards. So those are working in places where there are people who've already been exposed to COVID. There are already cases of COVID. And so the risk that the worker, that the healthcare worker poses to them, actually there isn't a risk from a COVID point of view. So we've been very thorough to make sure that we are minimising the risk at all levels with putting forward that or enabling that approach. Dr McElnay, with the Chatham Islands cases, what links have been established with the mainland? For example, what kind of links have been established between those cases and the Wellington protest group? I'm not aware of any links with Wellington protest group. 
the health services for the Chathams um, are provided by Canterbury District Health Board, and they are looking after uh, those uh, two individuals. Um, but that's all that I am aware of at this stage. Can I just go back to this new system? When did you make this decision? Was it always the plan to implement the system, or is it simply because you're facing chronic shortages? Um, well, sorry, was that the question back to the healthcare worker uh, issue? Yes, back to this new system. Yes, um, so we had, um, we've previously had a, a system in place that would allow healthcare workers in some situations to be able to return to work. So certainly that had been envisaged, but that was this situation where healthcare workers could go back early. Uh, so that's the, with a rat, a negative rat at day five and day six. So essentially for those healthcare workers shortening their period of, of isolation, but only to allow them to go to work. So that had always been something that uh, we we knew that we would um, probably need to to be able to um, implement, and then we were specifically asked to provide advice and a pathway for the very um, for the situation where you you may have a lot of COVID cases on a ward, and you've got staff that you need to care for them, and that those staff are well but have tested positive for COVID and um, so we we knew we knew that it was likely to be needed, but in terms of when it was implemented, it was last week, end of last week, that it was implemented and we were able to advise our health services over the weekend that that was now a pathway that um, was available for them. Do, do you know how many staff may take up this option to come back to work? And I guess what protections have been put in place to ensure that they don't spread COVID to other staff and patients who don't have COVID? Um, I don't have the numbers and it may be that, um, you know, that's why we, we, we put it in place as uh, to enable and we, we will ask the district health boards um, how many staff they are actually um, using on that pathway. I'm not aware of any staff currently using the pathway which allows them to go back to work immediately, but only in a, in a COVID ward. But we can um, check on the details um, for you. In, in both situations, we, we put a lot of uh, wraparound uh, in terms of uh, use of PPE, um, the staff being vaccinated, um, advice about um, how they interact with their co-workers during staff and meal breaks. And um, so we, we, we put a, little, a lot of guidance around that. There's, there's quite a lengthy guidance document that's been developed with um, DHBs so that um, um, staff at, at all times were, min were minimizing any risk to others from the staff. And do you know how many patients have um, missed out on planned operations because of the Omicron outbreak? Um, sorry, I don't have I don't have a, a number available for you. Most of our health services are reporting that they are continuing uh, to be able to keep business um, going as much as as possible. Uh, it's primarily in Auckland. Some of the hospitals there have have had to um, do some reduction in health services. I'm not aware of how many patients have actually been affected, but again, we can get those figures and and come back to you. With them. But, uh, of the current cases, what percentage are believed to be Delta and what percentage are thought to be Omicron? We, um, our assumption at the moment is that they're all Omicron, but that is an assumption because we do know, we did see at the beginning of the Omicron break, um, outbreak that there were still some Delta cases circulating. Our whole genome sequencing is, is the only way that we can really tell, distinguish between the Delta and the Omicron. And at the moment, because of the sheer number of cases, we're not able to whole genome sequence all of those cases. So there's a prioritization process in place for that whole genome sequencing that, that is very much focused on our hospitalized cases. The last report that I saw um, uh, suggested that uh, the, uh, the, what we're seeing is predominantly Omicron. 
cases are subject to whole genome sequencing and, and what we say predominantly, what percentage roughly? The, um, I, I, we can get you the, the actual percentage from the, the last report from ESR, but they report to us frequently on the, the whole genome sequencing. Um, they certainly were saying that Delta, they were, they were seeing the occasional Delta, but it's actually been some, some days since they'd seen the last case that was whole, gen whole genome sequenced as Delta, and we'll just get the date um, of that for you. I just want to caution that because we're not whole genome sequencing all of our cases, we actually cannot say whether there's, there's potentially still, still some delta out there. But our assumption and the most recent whole genome sequencing, I understand, has confirmed that it's Omicron that we're seeing. Um, our assumption is that, that this um, outbreak is um, primarily Omicron but there may still be a few Delta uh, in the community that we're not, uh, we haven't been able to pick up and whole genome sequence. How many cases have been whole genome sequenced? Thousands, hundreds, dozens? Um, it will be in the hundreds. And we've had to prioritize the, um, the, the um, samples that are referred to ESR. And so the primary focus at the moment is hospitalized cases. So it's in the hundreds. Medbank has just approved Paxlovid, but it's not going to arrive here until at least April um, after the Omicron spike. How likely is it that we'll be able to speed up that delivery? Um, I'm not aware of um, any particular issues there with that delivery. Obviously, um, we always we we'll always try to do what we can to um, increase or uh, speed up delivery if it's about distribution. Um, issues, um, we can take that away and look into this to see um, if there is any particular issue that we can speed up. We've, we've got some pretty strong capabilities around distribution that we developed during the vaccine program and obviously more recently uh, for rats tests. Um, Dr. Mephrono, there's still only 11 approved um, rapid antigen test types in New Zealand. Australia's approved more than 30. How satisfied are you with that situation with us lagging so far behind Australia and of course mm -hmm. numbers? Well, we have a process in place for approval of the rapid antigen tests. Um, my understanding is that our approval process has been recently reviewed to look at the criteria for approvals uh, that we, on the, on the basis of that review, um, the Ministry has gone back to um, a number of uh, rapid antigen test distributors and ask them to submit more information, which I understand we're waiting for that information to be received. And if that information is um, is acceptable, then um, likely that we will be approving more. I mean, we we are um, we have a we have a system and a process in place to make sure that the rat tests um, do do what they they say on the packet literally. Um, and so we're just very very mindful that we we. Uh, well, since we're relying so much on our uh, tests at the moment, we um, we do need to make sure that we've got um, as um, as accurate um, a test as as possible. So I'm, I'm confident that we will see uh, an increase in the number of rat tests that that we approve going forward. You have to bear in mind that we do have different systems and processes from Australia. Well, why, why are our systems and processes so much slower than Australia's then, and why a product that has been approved in Australia? Uh, and they're high, I'm not sure. It's been approved, not been approved sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, could you repeat that last bit? Why, um, why are our systems and processes so much slower than Australia's and um, why is it that products already approved in Australia, which has uh, standards comparable to or higher than our standards, not been approved yet? Yeah. I don't think it's an issue of us having slower processes, it's just that our processes are different and so that does mean that even though something um, is approved in Australia, that doesn't mean that it's automatically approved in New Zealand. That applies to a wide range of medicines, that's not just specific to rat tests. So this is something that New Zealand has, we have our own processes and our own criteria and uh, manufacturers have to, to meet our criteria in order um, to be approved. So um, that's what we're uh, working through. And um, I'm um, hopeful and confident that, yes, we will see 
um, some more rat tests approved once the manufacturers have completed their their process, which is to provide us with the information that we've asked for. Uh, what considerations have been made for the health workers that have to go back to work, given that stress, for example, is a factor in long COVID? We've been very clear in our guidance that staff should not feel pressurised to go back to work at all. And the Auckland District Health Boards have been discussing uh, with um, staff unions to make sure that um, uh, this is very, uh, this is this is um, understood that this is um, the case that staff should not feel pressurised to go back. And we've also requested that there is a daily staff check-in, uh, which is not just about COVID, but it's actually about their overall well-being. And if at any moment, any point in time, staff do feel um, stressed or concerned um, that they're back at work, um, then our recommendation back to the DHBs is that the staff should be stood down and that the DHBs look at alternative ways of staffing those facilities. Also, is there any particular reason you're in Napier today? Are you isolated? I'm not isolating from COVID, but I do have some symptoms and um, I'm following my own advice, which is if you're symptomatic, stay home. And Napier is my home. So um, I'm working from Napier. Um, doctor, just in relation to the Nature Journal finding that um, possibly uh, even mild Omicron infection may be bad for uh, brain, particularly smell and memory, have um, Ministry of Health officials um, taken this new study into account yet? And will they do so when providing future health advice? So was that question about long COVID? I missed the beginning of it. It's about a, a nature study of uh, seven to 800 participants and um, they found uh, significant deleterious long-term effects from the virus. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we are, we are looking at the effects of, the broader effects of COVID and the longer term effects of COVID. Um, it is our, um, our Office of Chief Clinical Officers at the Ministry are heading up the work um, in that area. We have been actively looking at the um, evidence, um, ever since um, COVID and the long-term effects of COVID um, became, we became aware of it. So that particular um, piece that you're referring to, I, I, I haven't read it myself, um, but I'm aware that our Chief Clinical Officers um, um, have. And we're also working with um, we're also uh, working with the University of Wellington to establish um, studies into the what we're seeing in New Zealand in terms of long-term effects of COVID. I will add, there's some content changes coming on the ministry website around long COVID in the coming days and weeks. Question for Michael: yeah. You've mentioned a number of technological sort of improvements or changes what capacity was there i suppose in the earlier part of the pandemic for this or is this been something like quite a massive shift that the ministry of health has had to pivot in implementing these things right um so i guess over the last couple of years we've built quite a broad ecosystem of of technologies to cover covid uh, probably began with contact tracing testing isolation quarantine vaccine and now care in the community. The, what, the care in the community piece, which is where we're looking to, I guess, better enable the health sector and welfare to support people isolating at home, does bring together a number of those technologies we've developed over the last couple of years. Um, it does also bring into play some of, I guess, the older technologies in the health system, a, bit, a little bit of a mix of the old and new. And there are a number of, I guess, there's integration between lots of the IT systems and, and data flows that don't always work in, in absolute real time. So that's, a, I guess, a constant challenge or opportunity for us to make things happen in real time. But yeah, we, we continue working on that. Any, any other questions today for either uh, Dr. McInerney or myself? Okay, well, thank you very much for coming along. Uh, I think we've got another media stand up on Thursday, so we'll probably see some of you there. All right, thanks very much. Thank you, goodbye. Thanks.